Okay. All right. So um, what I'm going to spend the first um, few minutes talking about is uh, the history of Study Finder, sort of where we are and uh, where we think we will be in the next few months. And then I'm going to turn it over to Laura Young. Um, and she's going to walk you through uh, the changes that were made and, and sort of what to expect. So, oh, I can't get the, there we go. So we all know um, why clinical research is important. And, and really it's, I think everyone that's on this, um, uh, on this call sitting in this webinar understands the importance of clinical research. We want to translate basic science discovery and really learn about understanding the mechanisms uh, using human tissues and samples, and that uh, defines clinical research. We want to uh, eventually discover new techniques to screen or new techniques to treat and diag or to, to diagnose a disease. Um, for the uh, surgical uh, in um, investigator, we want to test new techniques for surgery, and that's something that is extremely important. We want to move forward with our technology by bringing new drugs and new devices to market for human use, and that's something that obviously with Invent Penn State with, um, with Dr. Barron, we're, we're, we're pushing forward. We want to study new combinations of therapies, so even though some therapies are known, uh, the combinations may have different um, and sometimes additive effects. And then we want to develop new techniques and novel techniques. Uh, gene therapy is one example. So we certainly think as clinical researchers that clinical research is important, but our uh, patients and our research participants also feel it's important. And this is a survey that was done by Research America in uh, 2013. They surveyed a thousand adults um, and they asked them what their thoughts were related to clinical research. And what they found was less than 1% of the US population actually participates in clinical trials, um, which should be discouraging to all of us, but shouldn't be surprising to those of us who try to recruit patients into our um, interventional or observational studies but a large majority would participate if they were recommended by their provider. So we needed to figure out ways that we can get the message out, not only to our participants, but also to the providers that they see uh, for their clinical care. As far as what they would be willing to share and why, um, the large majority, as long as there were privacy protections in place, which I think we can assure at Penn State that we do have these privacy protections in place, that they would share their personal health information for the, the reasons that you can see down on the left side of the screen, to understand disease, to advance research, uh, and to improve care, and also for public health uh, uh, tracking. And so we do have partners with the general public and with the patients that we see in clinical research. We just need to figure out ways to uh, inform them of the research get that's going on, and uh, again, inform my providers. So a lot of this uh, came to head on our campus at, at uh, the College of Medicine when we had a town hall meeting two years ago, um, actually almost three years ago now, on clinical research. And we really tried to figure out what we could do to improve our, um, our clinical research portfolio. Um, and it really was across all of Penn State, not just the College of Medicine. Also, as part of our uh, CTSI renewal grant uh, from last year, really reaching out to the public and reaching out to our providers was listed as a thing that we really had planned on doing um, uh, full force. And so one of the things that came out of uh, the clinical trials town hall meeting that was in our CTSI renewal application was this target, which was to enhance our clinical research marketing and branding uh, to support patient recruitment. And I underlined to develop an online patient-friendly searchable database because that's what we proposed and that what was, that's what came out of our town hall meeting. That's what uh, has come out of my discussions with multiple people up at University Park related to recruitment and, uh, and certainly something that we, we did put in our, um, our, our application. And so why online? Well, we know that most people hear about clinical trials online. Um, and so we knew that we needed to get to where people look for clinical uh, trial and clinical research information. And again, this is from that same Research America um, uh, survey. So we launched Study Finder, um, and uh, it was something that uh, it seemed to at least initially uh, address the issues that we had related to recruitment and to notification. So this is a screenshot of what it looks like. I don't think that's going to change as we move forward. Um, and it was, the, the website is there, it's studyfinder.psu.edu. It was a research team fellow project. Dina Jefferson, who's our lead coordinator from the Heart and Vascular Institute at the College of Medicine Research Team, 
uh, really led the effort to get the first phase of Study Finder um, out and to the public. Um, because CTSI is built on shared information, this was a shared platform from University of Minnesota that we made our own. Uh, we changed it from um, maroon and gold to blue and white uh, to make it a Penn State study finder. And the way it works is it imports data nightly from clinicaltrials.gov. So any uh, study on clinicaltrials.gov that has us listed as a clinical site or that we own the study in clinicaltrials.gov gets pulled in nightly. Um, our site development was completed. We launched it in December of 2015, and that was in time for our CTSI renewal submission. Um, and, uh, and so we did reach that target. This is a screenshot of, uh, of what it looks like as far as the boxes or the categories of, of studies that are in there. These are not mutually exclusive. So if someone has, um, if a child has cancer, then the study will show up both in children's health and cancer. Um, and we will, this will change over time, but these were the, the uh, we actually added a few, but these were the basic ones that Minnesota had in their version of Study Finder. So when it was launched, what do we do post-launch? Well, we really made the conscious decision to soft market it. Uh, we didn't want to, because of the limitations, which I'll discuss in a minute, we didn't want to push it out fully, and, but we have been slowly increasing our uh, marketing. Um, we do some Google advertising, uh, again, for the, the College of Medicine studies, um, our Google hits are something that seem to be increasing, and this is a great way, I don't understand it, but it's a great way to reach our target population. We really stick uh, the website address on anything we can stick it on. Um, everything that has the CTSI or anything that has clinical research, um, at least at the College of Medicine, has Study Finder, has the Study Finder website on it now, and I hope that extends to... Um, to University Park as we move to the second phase. And I'm gonna have Sarah sort of help me here because I wanna switch screens a bit um, to show you some advertising that we've done at the Hershey Bears games uh, just recently. And this, hopefully this will work. If it doesn't, I apologize. Sarah's going to switch back now. So that's um, that gives you an idea of, of sort of the the, the uh, novel ways that we're looking to really um, uh, publish uh, and 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 celebrate the clinical research that we do here, and certainly certainly something that I would love to see across all Penn State campuses across the state. Um, if you look at the the, the metrics, um, and Joan Concilio, who's our web specialist, uh, knows these better than anyone. We've had more than 45,000 views by potential volunteers since we launched it in November. So even with our soft, soft marketing, um, I'm not sure you can call that the Bears uh, video soft marketing, but it certainly uh, is something that we just added. We really do seem to have a lot of traffic and, and we'd like to see that grow and certainly we'll track it um, as we move forward. So that's what Study Finder is as of now, as of yesterday. And, and we knew that there were some limitations. The first one and the biggest one was it really only draws studies from clinicaltrials.gov. And that's a, that's a major issue. So there's only a subset of trials that require registration. And a lot of the clinical research that we do does not require registration, so is not represented. Many times the information on clinicaltrials.gov is out of our control. So uh, a sponsor owns the... Uh, the uh, the study and they we rely on them to put our information in correctly, including contact information, and that's not always the case. Um, it really because of the way clinicaltrials.gov uh, was developed, it has changed recently. But it really mainly only covered our campus at the College of Medicine, and certainly didn't fit into what we wanted to represent through the CTSI. And there's really no place for other types of important clinical research, things that are near and dear to my heart and many others, um, including observational studies, survey studies, and healthy volunteer recruitment, which we all do a lot of. And so it was good for a start, but we knew it had these limitations. And so really immediately after it was launched, we began planning an upgrade and tried to address some of these issues. 
And so it really was a, a, a cast of thousands that put this together, well, maybe dozens. And, and I don't want to leave anyone out. I was going to give a list of names, but I knew I would forget someone. But, but this is a, a, a representative group that came together to work on this. It was the CTSI staff, uh, our College of Medicine web and strategic services staff. We had research staff and investigators giving us input on both campuses. The University Park Office of Research Information Systems, uh, Laura will be speaking to you soon. The College of Medicine uh, Research Information Technology staff uh, really developed the site after we made changes in CATS IRB. And then obviously a lot of interaction with uh, the both staffs of our, our IRB offices. So where are we? Well, we're live as of yesterday. I sent, um, uh, we were laughing, I think I sent 6,600 emails yesterday and, and about 10% of them bounced back. Um, but hopefully everyone who is listed as a contact person in CATS IRB got an email from me um, that talked about the launch and what needs to be done. The idea now is that well now it will pull data nightly and automatically from CATS IRB. So instead of clinicaltrials.gov where we had no control and it was only our, our phase two and some phase two, uh, three, I mean phase three and some phase two and four studies, this will be all of our clinical research where people are recruiting participants actively and they want to be part of study finder. There were new smart forms that were developed in CATS IRB. Laura's gonna show you those in a second. And it really is aimed at people who are recruiting participants. If you wanna be part of Study Finder, um, you will put in a modification and you will be included in Study Finder. So our timeline, uh, like I said, we launched yesterday. From now until June 1st, 2017, modifications will be submitted through CATS IRB through, um, through both IRBs. And uh, as of June 1st, uh, as long as we have a reasonable number of studies, then Study Finder, uh, the first phase of Study Finder will be replaced by phase two, and it will replace anything from clinicaltrials.gov through CATS IRB. If, if your study is on there now and it has a clinicaltrials.gov number, we will maintain that link, um, but the, uh, the, the automatic pull from clinicaltrials.gov will disappear, uh, hopefully, on June 1st. Um, there's an outstanding page that's, um, if you look on Study Finder and there's a, a, a for researchers page that has all of the information on how to update your study and that's some of the things that Laura is going to talk about now. But this is a resource that is available uh, to anyone at any time as you move forward through it You'll, uh, so there won't be any surprises as you go through CATS IRB. So um, I, my story has certainly grown tiresome so uh, now we dance and Laura is going to take over and show you actually how we do it. Okay. <laughs> All right, Laura, do you know how to share the screen, grab the screen? Uh, Sarah can help me out here. I don't yep. see, but yep, share screen. Um, I think you guys need to stop sharing so that I can share. Okay, you should be good to go. Okay, are you seeing a click login screen? Yep, you are good. Great, okay. So good afternoon everyone. Thanks Neil for in inviting um, the system side to, to kind of show what we're, what we've done here. We've been pretty excited to be part of this project. Um, a, a thought that our team all expressed out loud yesterday was that uh, every, every day we maintain, you know, the research that's going on and, and do all these behind the scenes things and we feel pretty proud of and good of our work, we're good with our work, but being part of Study Finder was felt a little elevated in that way to be able to help get um, this information to our lay community and we were really excited to have something that felt more directly uh, related to benefit to uh, potential participants. So, so thanks for involving us. Um, what we're going to show this afternoon is uh, very quickly. I want you know want to keep it brief so that you guys have time to ask questions, and we can demo other things if that's helpful to you. But we're going to demo what it's going to look like for a researcher to go into the system and interact with the new Study Finder Smart Form page. I'm going to log in as a fake um, a fake researcher, <laughs> uh, so I'm sort of impersonating a researcher role here so that it looks as uh, close to what you see today as possible. And um, as is the case with uh, any time that you start a new study, you will be um, logged into your inbox. So this is the default view for everybody that comes into CATS IRB. As you know, on the left side, there's a create new study button. 
And we're gonna blow pretty quickly here through uh, getting to the study finder page. But um, as you know, there are some required fields that we have to fill out to show you how to get there. Uh, but we're gonna pause in a couple places so that you understand the interaction between Cats IRB and study finder as clearly as possible. The first one that you'll encounter is this brief description field. You may or may not notice that we did change it slightly um, to include the words in lay language. We also added a little bit of help text. Um, I don't know how many people use these, but we do keep them updated and we try to put relevant information in there for you. But we added this note to encourage you to understand how important this field is going to be if you're utilizing Study Finder as a recruitment tool. You must provide your, lay, your description in lay language. Um, and to whatever extent you can help researchers understand what they'll do with your study, this is the place that you're going to do it. So to date, we've seen a lot of different behavior in this field. We've seen copy and paste from grant applications. We've seen very technical language here. If you're using Study Finder, this is the spot where you're going to make it as clear as you can. Um, so, you know, if you, uh, I have to participate in my study. Um, obviously, you wouldn't write it that way, but I'm putting some text here so that you'll see what that looks like. Answering other required questions just to get through the form, I'm required to upload protocol document, as you know, so I'm just going to put a dummy document in there to get through. And pressing continue to get to the next page. For the purposes of this demo, the um, funding sources have nothing to do with what we're talking about today, so I'm just gonna bypass that. Study team members are also not incredibly relevant to the demo today, so I'll bypass that, but I am required to upload a document for study team qualifications, so I'm gonna put another dummy document here just to get by. And I'm gonna press continue. And our scope questions are not relevant to our discussion today. So thanks for your patience while I get to where we need to go. All right, on the consent and recruitment materials page today, what you're used to doing is adding consent forms um, that are relevant to your research as well as recruitment materials. That has not changed. However, um, recruitment materials, you will need to think through what they need to be if you're using Study Finder as a recruitment tool. Um, if you think about it, um, when you put information in Study Finder, your, particip your potential participants are interacting with that site online. And so they're going to probably look for a field that has a name, a phone number, or an email address. And they are going to contact you that way. So you'll have to think about when you receive that communication from a participant, whether it be by email or by phone, how, what that script is that you'll be uh, using to discuss with them. So we did add a little bit of language here in the recruitment material area to just remind you, you know, you may need to add a phone or email script as your recruitment materials if you're utilizing Study Finder. Um, so that reminder's there, it is under the help text, uh, but something for you to think about as you're preparing your submission for review by the IRB offices. Um, what comes next, I'm on an extremely slow computer right now, so you saw a little bit of code glitch, but you shouldn't see that at your desk. Um, what you see next is our Study Finder page. So this is new. If you think about this in terms of where you are in your submission process, um, we did purposefully place the Study Finder recruitment page after consent forms and recruitment materials while it should be fresh on your mind. Um, and we also um, put it before other questions that are tangentially related, like clinical trials and the STAR, that sort of thing. So what this is asking is if you um, would like to use Study Finder as a recruitment tool for your research. We provide a link right here um, so that you can jump to the site that Neil already showed you um, that is available online for uh, any participants to come in and interact with. If you're reading this and thinking, gosh, I have no idea what this is at all, we do have a help text um, here as well that, that is a little bit lengthier than what we generally put in our help text, but to help orient you with what Study Finder is. And this covers basically, in a much shorter way, what Neil uh, just reviewed with you where it came from, why we're doing this, what it is, who you can contact if you have problems, which that's Neil, you just met him, and um, what to do if you want to update your study finder information. We've made a pretty strong rule when we moved to CATS IRB from PRAMS 
to stop putting the same information in duplicate places. So you'll see here that we're directing you to the study submission guide, which is available in the Help Center if you need step-by-step -step instructions. However, hopefully we have made this as clear as possible for you so that you don't need specific instructions. Um, and you'll see that you have a yes, no, or this is not applicable to my study. Uh, no and not applicable will get you to the same place. So it, you know, how you want to handle that is up to you. But if you say yes, um, you'll see that your screen expands and provides you for a little bit more information. We're going to cover um, all the parts here. Um, the first one is this alert box, which is reminding you, this is going to be temporary, this red message up top, but it's reminding you that no matter what you do here today, you're not going to see it in Study Finder until June 1st. That's, that was a very purposeful decision. Um, the, the reason there is we didn't want to just wipe out everything that was in Study Finder. So Neil showed you a box or um, a screenshot that had a lot of boxes with what the categories of research were where, where research may be available for your participation today. If we were to cut over immediately right now to tax IRB, there would be zero. And so the people who have been receiving benefits, um, ranging from the researchers who are seeking participants and the participants who are participating in that research, um, it would have completely wiped that out and started from scratch. So we thought we would allow a little bit of time to build up the studies uh, that are opting to use it, um, study finder as a recruitment tool from CATS IRB. So that's, that's what this message is trying to relay um, as succinctly as possible, and that will happen on June 1st. Um, also mentioned here is some important information that you need to keep in mind. The first one is that the study information presented here must be consistent with your submission documents. Some of you might be sitting at your desks thinking, gosh, don't I put recruitment, recruitment, recruitment information into my protocol? And yes, that's true. So what you want to make sure is that you're not saying something different on this page than what you're saying in your protocol. Um, it's important that our protocols remain as a standalone document um, that can describe the research. So there may be a slight amount of redundancy between these two places. Our reviewers are prepared to be looking for that and to be catching it, but we hope and expect that as uh, researchers who are filling this out that you will take that time to do that as well. Um, the next point is to mention that information that will be displayed in Study Finder appears exactly as you provided here. There's no Google word fixing, there's no buddy in between saying, gosh, I really think Dina meant to say from instead of form. Um, you need to take care of that on this end yourself um, and make sure that you're thinking through what a participant is going to see and how they're going to interact with this and if they're going to understand it. I think one of the things that I heard in, in the assistance in developing this was that what is displayed on clinicaltrials.gov is quite technical at times and probably a little bit overwhelming for uh, typical participants that are looking at the site. So I think that's something to keep in mind. You have a little bit more control over that now than you did before. The other thing we're alerting you to here, because this doesn't happen elsewhere in CATS, this may or may not be necessary, but we wanted to let you know. Um, and I don't know how well you can see this on the screen because of the, the color, um, but items two, three, and four are grayed out. Um, and what we're trying to do is to display back to you here all the things that are going to move over to Study Finder once that integration is fully in place. So what that means is that if there's something you want to change, so if the title of your study is not the one that you expect to pull over, um, you can go back to the basic information page, which is telling you here, and you can change it. Likewise, if you read this and you think, gosh, I wasn't really thinking about Study Finder, when I wrote my brief description and I realize now it's not in lay language, you can go back to that page and change it. Um, but we're showing you here what's going to be displayed so that you have sort of a quick preview of what we'll send to Study Finder. The next question talks about in-person participation. Um, we will be interested to see how researchers respond to this. We did have a lot of feedback on it and adjusted it slightly. You can say no, that in-person participation is not required, or you can say yes. And if you do, what we did was we pulled in the general regions near Penn State campuses where participants may be expected to travel to, um, to pick up a meal, to fill out some paperwork, to go for a blood drop, whatever the, whatever the things are that you're asking them to do uh, to participate in your research. If they need to leave their home and go somewhere to do it, this is where um, you would 
identify a nearby region where that would happen. This will help participants say, ah, this is in Hershey and I'm never going to be in Hershey. And so I probably should not select this um, study to participate in because I'm unable to get there. Um, or it might open up a conversation of, I'd really like to participate and I think I'm a great candidate. Do you want to get me there somehow? That's, that's beyond uh, what the form's trying to do, but just to alert participants what, um, what travel may be necessary for that research. Um, the next one is age. So again, very important that you keep this consistent with what's in your protocol. So if you are involving anybody of any age, you would just check both boxes and you'll see that it's reminding you to check all and apply. We kept this quite simple. I think in other areas within the university, you'll see selections of age in things like under five years old and five to 12 and 13 to 18 and, and things like that. We stuck with uh, age of majority and above below. That's it. Um, as far as gender is concerned, you can choose one uh, selection here. Healthy volunteers is the next question. We do have a health bubble on this. Um, we're expecting that some researchers uh, that aren't familiar with clinical studies may need some help understanding what this means. So we did include some health, or I'm sorry, some health text here um, to help sort that out. Researchers are still encouraged to contact their analysts or the office for assistance if they don't know how to answer these questions. The next one's also pretty important, um, and it does interact with the Healthy Volunteers question as well. Um, and that is to choose a category. Um, the box that Neil showed you, um, where you know participants will see this range of, of possible themes that they can participate in. You can come here, you can check um, whatever fits your study, and um, that's where it's gonna be categorized. So as to keep the site as clean as possible, um, you are only allowed to select up to three categories. So an important interaction between healthy volunteers and the categories is that if you check yes to healthy volunteers, this will also show up in the healthy volunteers category on the site. So what that means is you're not required to, you'll see that the little red asterisk is not here. You're not required to also pick these if you're just looking for healthy volunteers. That'll show up in its own sort of bucket. If you say healthy, healthy volunteers are not involved, then you are required to um, select up to three categories and you'll see that that requirement changes. Um, that was pretty subtle, I'll do it again. So if you say yes or no, you'll see that that requirement changes on that question. This is an area we expect to continue to review um, the study finder development team and the CATS development team as uh, these if these need to be expanded or changed. Um, there was a lot of discussion about what's appropriate. Um, what the right ones were, and uh, I can show you that we'll be looking at that as we continue to go live here. The next question is about your um, inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. Again, we provided help text on both of these questions uh, to help understand, and one of, the, one of the themes, one of the things that we're saying in here is that, you know, you may want to be um, mindful of what not to include in this field. So this is used to display information in study finder, but it should be considered along with the other fields displayed from this page, like age, gender, healthy volunteers. What we mean by that is you don't want to waste one of five lines on age when age is already addressed up here in question number six. Um, you don't want to waste one of five lines on gender if there's nothing more to describe than all male or female. Um, so that's something to keep in mind so that you can use these um, as best you can. You're also not required to list five, it's up to five. Uh, so if you just include one here, then that's all that, um, that, that'll move over as well. It won't require you to do the other four. The last piece is um, identifying a person on the study team who will be responsible for addressing questions from potential participants concerning enrollment. This is where you need to list your first name, last name, telephone number, and email address. You'll see that email address is required. We decided that at a minimum, we at least need to have that so that participants have um, at least that way of contacting um, the research team. An important piece of information about this field is that you must end your um, email address in psu.edu, Gmail, AOL, Hotmail, Yahoo, none of them are allowable. Um, and if you hadn't noticed this before, Penn State Health 
those end in psu.edu, so we're good for either site's um, uh, email addresses. So that's the extent of the form. Um, as it is today, and Neil already described this, you would need to submit a modification to get the option to include this. Those of you that have pending studies right now that are being reviewed, this page is already there. So this may interrupt <laughs> a little bit um, in that if you were just about ready to get approved and you were just filling in a few more last details, this page will appear. If you're not ready to do it now, you can go ahead and press no or not applicable as appropriate and come back and fill it later if you'd like to. Um, we're, I, I'm not gonna uh, go through the rest of the form, we were just trying to get up to this point. There are changes beyond um, the form from this point forward. But um, I think it is important to, to think through and talk through with your team um, how, best to, how best to get your study over to Study Finder if you like to in the timing when you do that. You don't have to do it by June 1st. The June 1st deadline is for those people who are already in there and may want to continue to be in there now that this tax IRB switch has happened. So it's important to point out that um, the changes when, when Neil said we went live, so Study Finder has been live. Um, what went live was the change where CATS IRB now includes this as the primary source of information to obtain what you're doing with Study Finder, um, and it will feed to Study Finder after June 1st. So that's all I have to show um, available and happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Great, thank you, Laura. Um, if anyone has any questions, we ask that you please just type in, I have a question. Um, we have quite a few people on the line, so wanna try to get to everyone's questions in the most efficient way possible. So Neil, I'll throw yeah. this up. Did I miss anything? Did I miss anything in what you were hoping to see covered there? No, I think that that was great. Um, a lot of this is going to be um, learned by uh, just getting in there and, and working on it. And I think there are times, as I was going through some of the development uh, tests, I would put something in and I realized it really wasn't lay language. And when I saw the whole screen of everything that would come out, I realized that it, it probably wasn't what I wanted to relay. We, um, the, the fact that you can look at everything on the one smart form at once and see what it's going to look like, I think is important as people will, will learn and make changes. Again, this is, this is completely voluntary. Um, if you don't want your studies on Study Finder, then you click no and, and you move on and nothing changes. Uh, but the idea is that we hope to have a one-stop shop for all of the clinical research and recruitment, including healthy volunteers, across the entire university. And I think this is, uh, this is a tool that will help us get there. Um, it, it, go ahead, Laura. A piece of feedback that our team and other development teams at Penn State hear a lot um, as a complaint from researchers, which is, I already gave you this information somewhere. I already gave you my grant application when I submitted initially. Why do I have to give it to you in this system, in this system, in this system? We're working hard to kind of map out what that journey looks like for researcher customers so that we can remove those redundant points where possible. So as it relates to Study Finder, you know, while you may feel some inconveniences about having to do it in your IRB process, the idea was to reduce um, the points where you needed to provide the same information um, within the institution for something else. So this was in direct, you know, sort of benefit to that to that problem which is to say you know you already gave us your your study title let's not have you given it to us again you already gave us your brief description which is probably going to be the bulk of what researchers are going to be looking at with this um, let's not make you give it again somewhere else and therefore put, put, you know create potential issues with contradictory information or redundant information or whatever so that was very purposeful that's a good point uh, we have a question about um, modifications for studies already in Study Finder. To be clear, from now until June 1st, Study Finder will stay exactly as it is. It will draw from clinicaltrials.gov. Um, it'll update nightly for whatever is in there. Um, and we will make changes as we have been for the past year or so. Once June 1st comes, if you do not 
submit a modification for studies that are presently on Study Finder, they will not be part of the phase two of Study Finder. So we are no, we are no longer going to be pulling data from clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so the reason we have the, the 60 day window or cushion is to give people time to make those modifications. It should be relatively quick. Um, it will require administrative review at both HSPOs because um, it is recruitment material. But um, as of June 1st is our target, then anything in Study Finder that did not get modified through, through uh, CATS IRB will no longer be um, shown on Study Finder. I hope that answers the question. And I'll add to that, Neil, I, I think I glazed over this too quickly, but uh, just to point out that it will not move to study finder from CATS IRB until the study is approved. Correct. And likewise, um, it will not display or it will be removed from study finder if it's not approved. So what that means is if your study lapses, when that nightly automation occurs to refeed the information back to study finder from the activities of CATS IRB from you know, that day, if it moved to a lapse state or a closed state, it will come out of there um, automatically. Likewise, if your study is in a funding state, it will not show up in Study Finder. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, if you submit your application today, you should not, and you know, it's still not approved, you should not expect to see it immediately in Study Finder tomorrow. It, you do need to get through that process of approval. And then once you are there, you need to remain approved um, for it to continue to be to be in that system, so. Uh, and on the, the opposite end of that, when your study moves from actively enrolling to uh, just data analysis or, or long-term follow-up, then uh, you will, uh, as you go in and inform the IRB that you are no longer recruiting, then um, you will change your answer to the question about uh, are you recruiting to know, and then it will disappear from Study Finder. The, the, the problem now is that many of our studies through clinicaltrials.gov aren't updated to no longer enrolling. And so we get uh, daily uh, contacts from people for studies um, that are no longer enrolling. They're not open to enrollment anymore. They're still open, but the clinicaltrials.gov is not updated either locally or from the sponsor. Great. Thank you. So there's a question um, actually, I'll read this one for you, Laura. Can you insert web links into CATS IRB that will appear in Study Finder, i.e. to send potential participants to a specific study website? Yes, um, I, I think I'm going to make a note right now to see that we can test with the Study Finder team to see if they come over um, as live links. Um, but you can definitely insert that information in there. So if, if it's not a live link, um, then at least they'll have it that they can copy into a URL, you know, to the to the browser. I did see that Jim Robertson was on the uh, participant list. I don't know if he has anything to add to that, but but we will take a look at it. So we might have him muted, but Jim, type in if you if you could answer that, and we'll uh, we'll figure out how to unmute you. There he is. He's unmuted. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're unmuted, Jim. Okay. So yeah, that's a good, great question. Uh, I don't have an answer for you at this time. I just know through clinicaltrials.gov, the information we're pulling in does not have web link information in it, but uh, certainly that's something we'll uh, test and we'll respond to uh, everyone about. It sounds, that's a great suggestion though. We should have that. Okay. Um, Gene Lingrich was the one that asked that question, Jim. So when we figure it out, we'll get the answer back to Gene. Any other questions from the audience? All right. For those of you on the College of Medicine on the Hershey campus, we'll be pre presenting this briefly at Roar on Tuesday at 9 a.m. Um, so if you have any questions, you can bring them there. Um, anyone else, um, myself, Laura, Jim, uh, Joan, uh, Concilio, um, can all answer questions or at least direct you to the person who can answer that question. Great. And this presentation has been recorded, so we'll share that with you later this afternoon. Um, but thank you for joining us, and we we'll hope to see you at an upcoming webinar.
Thank you.